Hello and welcome to the first lecture of Introduction to Museology. Um, I hope you all are doing well. Thank you to those who have been sending me your favorite museums and where you're from. It seems like we have a very international class, which is great. Um, to begin, I wanted to stop and ask if you recognize these three museums. A Google search of the most famous museums in the world lists these three. Um, Number one is the Louvre, number two is the Smithsonian Institute, and number three is the British Museum. It's okay if you didn't get these right away. As we go through this course, you'll become very familiar with them because there's a reason these are all so noteworthy. It has to do with their appearance, their collection, and how they engage with, engage with visitors. Um, we'll talk about these three well-known museums, but we'll also talk about lesser-known museums. One thing I will say is these three museums, they all have a large scope. They all try to attract a large audience. So that's part of the reason why they're so well known. But other museums have a very niche approach or a very specific approach. And we'll talk about that too and how they engage their specific um, customers, you know, visitors, that kind of thing. We'll talk about that. This lecture will discuss the development of museums over time, but before we do that, I want you to have a foundation about the definitions, the modern definitions of museums that we have today. So first of all, museology. Um, this was a definition I gave you in the introduction lecture, the practice of organizing, arranging, and managing museums, and the study of the history of museums, their role in society, as well as the activities they engage in curating, education, public programming, and education. Um, a quick note on this definition, I want you to keep in mind that museums and the study of museums involves a lot of different things. It's not just about studying history, there's a lot of aspects of museums, and a lot of people go into museums having specific interests. For example, there would be an art historian who would be responsible for the preservation of paintings, or the education part of it would be making sure that what is said in the exhibits aligns with certain school programs or making sure that there's places for schools to go to when they want to learn outside the museum space, things like that. And curating, obviously everybody thinks about that, but that's not the main aspect of museums and there's a lot more that goes behind the scenes in museums. These are some more modern examples of museums. Uh, a museum in its simplest form consists of a building to house collections of objects for inspection, study, and enjoyment. And that was from Douglas Allen, former director of the Royal Scottish Museum. Um, a museum is a non-profit permanent institution in the service of society and its development open to the public, which acquires, conserves, researches, communicates, and exhibits the tangible and intangible heritage of humanity and its environment for the purpose of education, study, and enjoyment. Again, we're seeing those words, education, study, um, and enjoyment, yeah. International Council of Museums. Um, the American Association of Museums in Developing a Nationwide Museum Accreditation Program defines a museum as an organized and permanent nonprofit institution, essentially educational or aesthetic in purpose with professional staff which owns and utilizes tangible objects, cares for them, and exhibits them to the public on some schedule. So I want to draw your attention that a couple of these definitions, they use the word permanent and they use the word tangible and intangible. That's something we'll talk about. Um, museums aren't just for the objects that are on display. They want to sh get you thinking about things beyond the scope of what you see. So these are things we'll talk about, but... These are just little points I want to point out right now. As you'll see in this lecture, what scholars conceive of as museums goes back a long way. The development of museums goes back to as early as the medieval period and before. But museum studies and museology is a relatively new discipline. Museology is a discipline very much focused in the social science, anthropology, and humanism. Basically, the disciplines that relate to human behavior. And that's why I have the definition of collecting here, which is creating an archive of objects to save it from destruction through time by the technical means of conservation. So the conservation is very important to pay attention to, but I also want to highlight that collecting is also creating a large display of things. 
Um, I hate to say it, but collecting is a lot about things that you want to save and that you want to have to remember a certain period. So these are items that you might think about. Um, and maybe you do collecting yourself and maybe you might consider that a museum in itself. These are things we're going to think about today as we look at the process of collecting and how it's developed to what we consider museums. To begin our study of the ancient development of museums, I'm going to draw your attention to cabinets of curiosity. These were mentioned a bit in the reading I got you to do earlier. So cabinets of curiosity, they first appeared in Renaissance Europe, and they're an early example of a museum. They're usually referred to, they usually refer to a room, but they're often called wonder rooms. And you can understand why when we look at cabinets of curiosity, because it's often just a huge accumulation of very valuable and important things. Um, they store and exhibit a wide variety of objects. They attempt to categorize and tell stories about the natural world. The natural world is something that's going to come up in this these lectures um, because museums are very focused on the natural world and how we moved from the Big Bang to where we are now. Um, cabinets of Curiosity were often organized in four categories, Artificia, Naturalia, Exotica, and Scientifica. So I'm going to give a definition of these words now. Artificia refers to man-made objects, showcasing skills in applied and fine art. Scientifica encompasses instruments for the understanding and quantification of the world, such as compasses and globes. Exotica covers curious objects from foreign lands. I'm going to stop in Exotica and say that um, when we talk about Exotica, the word exotic comes up a bit in museums, so Exotica can be very focused on what could be familiar to one person and that could be different to another person. So that's something we're going to think about in our museum studies too, is how um, perspective and biases can come through in museums and how we can avoid that. And Naturalia, you may have already guessed, focuses on the marvels of nature. One of the earliest and most well-known examples of a cabinet of curiosity is that of Ferrante Imperato. Um, this cabinet was called Del Historia Naturale, and it was the earliest pictorial representation of a natural history cabinet. You'll notice that I'm using the word cabinet, but as I said earlier, it's actually a room, as you can see in the picture. Um, this is from 1599 Naples. The cabinet belonged to Ferrante Imperato, who was a naturalia collector and apothecary. And he used this collection to display his research. To give you an example of his research, he accumulated a large collection, um, some say more than 35,000 specimens. He had animals, minerals, vegetable oddities. Um, a, something that's mentioned a lot in his collection is his stuffed terrestrial and marine animals, his stuffed birds, shells, stones, gems, and fossils. Sound familiar? Yeah, it's a natural history museum. People of that time period were very interested in Ferrante Imperato's intellect, and that's what caused people to be interested in what he had to say in his collection. That's something about museums that you'll learn. It's about showing what you know and what you have. Um, Ferrante Imperato's book was the first comprehensive natural history book that was written in Italian, as opposed to written in or translated from Latin. I've included a link to Ferrante Imperato's collection so you can have a look at it yourself. It is in Latin, but it's interesting to look at that. And also in this PowerPoint, I have images from the Del Historia Naturale. You'll notice that like in museums and like in Naturalia, that these images and scientific objects are grouped by type. So that will make it easier to understand, even if you don't understand the language or what you're looking at. And that's something in museums, too. They're grouped according to type, so you can sort of associate by something that's near it. And that's something that museum curators think about when they're developing stories as well. I've included some other examples of cabinets of curiosity. One is the Augsburg Art Cabinet, which is from 1632 and was a gift to King Gustavus. Adolphus of Sweden. Um, I won't explain too much about this because I've included a link which shows you what's actually in that cabinet and I think it's really interesting. But I will talk about this other cabinet which was created by the anatomist Frederick Roisk 
from 1638 to 1731. These were included in his cabinet of curiosity. Frederick Royce was known for his remarkable still life displays, which blurred the boundary between scientific preservation and Benetus art. Um, he was a Dutch professor in anatomy and botany, and he was he was working in the Netherlands. Frederick Royce is recorded to have collected over 2,000 anatomical and biological specimens that were either embalmed or dried and then displayed. So again, we're seeing intellect and exotica in a certain sense being collected for a purpose to be admired and to be presented to the public. Next, I'm going to talk about Princess Enigal de Nana, who is considered by historians to be the first museum curator. Um, Enigal de Nana was the priestess of the moon deity Sin and the daughter of Neo-Babylonian king Naboridus. Um, Enigal de Nana is from Ur, and she lived around 530 BCE, and she is recorded to have arranged and labeled artifacts that were collected. Um, this collection was later found in 1925 by archaeologist Sir Charles Leonard Woodley. He found that these artifacts ranged from 2100 BCE to 600 BCE. Um, the interesting thing about this is clearly that she went one step forward and labeled these objects. And another thing of note that she did is that she arranged these, which were from different geological areas and historical settings and they were neatly assembled together. So hopefully you're starting to see examples of how what we know as museums today sort of correlating it with this past development. Another museum I'm going to talk about is the Museum of Alexandria which housed the Library of Alexandria. You may have heard of both. Um, the Library of Alexandria was founded around the third century by Ptolemy Soter who was the ruler of Europe. Um, the Library of Alexandria was one of the largest libraries of the ancient world, and um, the Library and Museum of Alexandria had some objects, including statues of thinkers, astronomical and surgical instruments, elephant trunks, and animal hides, and a botanical and zoological park. Um, but the thing to pay attention to and the thing that makes it a modern museum is that it was chiefly a university or philosophical academy. So a lot of museums now, they have to accommodate learning and they have to accommodate um, education, research, archives, that kind of thing. That's what I want to bring about with this example is that it was a place for learning as much as it was a place for musing and things like that. We've talked about a lot of museums today, but not a lot of them were available to the public. In the ancient world, museums were very much a sign of status and a sign of the elite. So if you knew somebody, you could visit these museums. That's why I want to bring your attention to the Ashmolean Museum, which is the first public museum. The Ashmolean Museum was established in 1682 when the wealthy antiquary Elias Ashmole gifted his collection to Oxford University. Elias Ashmole was well known at the time for being one of the founders of the Royal Society. Um, to give a definition, the Royal Society is a national scientific institution and is now known as the oldest national scientific institution in the world. So again, we're seeing intellect. Um, Elias Ashmole was an avid collector. He acquired a large portion of his collection from two gardeners. Uh, they had traveled the world and had acquired remarkable collections of geological and zoological items, as well as man-made objects. So I hope again you're seeing Naturalia Exotica and Scientifica. And again, we're seeing the interest in the museum coming from the collection of a wealthy and intellectual man. These are all ideas I wanted to bring about today. To end, I wanted to bring us full circle to the British Museum, which is called the first national public museum of the world. In 1753, the British Museum was founded from an act of parliament and the museum opened to the public in 1759. It was the first museum to cover all fields of human knowledge and was aimed at all studious and curious persons. So the British Museum, what I find so interesting about it is it highlights all fields of human knowledge. So it's not just specific information. Like I said, it's not just a niche understanding and all studious and curious persons. So I think that's interesting too, because it doesn't, it doesn't negate anybody because of their intellect or because they're not educated. 
as you've seen through this lecture, I hope, is that museums had developed from intellectual people showing off their wealth and people who probably aren't as an intellect or aren't as wealthy, they come to. Also, I wanted to highlight that the British Museum was brought about because of an act of parliament. So clearly there was a need for some kind of institution, some kind of public knowledge institution. And there we have the British Museum, it's still here today. It obviously did what it was intended to do. This lecture focused primarily on the traditional type of museums, which is the Natural History Museum and Human History Museums. But over the coming weeks, and especially in the next lecture or two, I'm going to be talking about different types of collections and different ways that museums can establish themselves. So I look forward to doing this course with you, and as always, connect with me on email or through Google Classrooms.